Well, I got another video topic here I'm going to cover with asbestos. And, uh, and uh, again, uh, one of the things we have uh, going on in Texas is we have the, uh, the, the issue of we're going to start doing possibly more floor tile by transmission electron microscopy. We're probably going to start seeing more people uh, conducting transmission electron microscopy analysis of floor tile uh, because of some of the input, some of the impact of the new Texas rules. And um, some of the requirements are going to require that bulk, some of the regulations are going to require that some of the bulk samples are going to have to be addressed in such a way that it may just be cheaper to go ahead and get TEM done with that right off the bat. But whatever, uh, one of the things in the floor tile um, clearance debate. Some states don't even regulate floor tile. They consider it non-friable. You have to break it up a lot before you're even regulated. In Texas, removing any amount, whether it's friable or not, is regulated and does require clearance. So there are going to be some, some issues that we're going to have moving forward. So this is the reason why I put this video together here. This is uh, abatement clearance testing. Abatement clearance testing. TEM, transmission electron microscopy clearance versus phase contrast microscopy uh, uh, clearance as well. This debate has raged on in our industry for about whether to, uh, to leave or pass a project based on air sampling using, e in, using either the PCM, uh, an analytical technique, or the transmission electron uh, uh, microscopy uh, analytical technique. The, the debate has uh, meritorious points to be made on both sides. And some very dis, uh, discouraging defense of lesser techniques are also put forward. And uh, there are some lesser analytical techniques out there uh, that are probably not as good. We're, we do have people who are trying to put the fibrous aerosol monitor in with clearance as well. And one of the things you get in the issues of the NIOSH 7400, the PNCAM 239, uh, dealing with phase contrast microscopy, most of it was generally for uh, analysis of personal samples or personal exposures. It really wasn't designed to do uh, clearance. Now, we can adapt it for that, but we have to adapt it in such a way that the method, the validation, the validated method is put, is, is put forefront. Uh, currently, right now, we put way too much uh, influence and, and way too much uh, pressure on people in terms of time. And uh, again, just because something is uh, time efficient does not me necessarily make it scientific. So the goal, what is the goal of clearance on an asbestos project? Now, we got a lot of people who think, well, when you get to these clearance levels that EPA has put out or whatever, you're safe. And that's not really a key. This is not, these are not safe levels. These are levels which we can reoccupy. And that's really what we're looking for. And these two things we look at for the whole process, air sampling is part of it. You have visual and a judgment of how clean, clean, how clean things are. And then the aggressive stirring up of, of materials in order to see if we have anything that is suspended. And so the, the first thing we're looking at is the satisfactory performance of the abatement and then the thorough cleaning of the work site. Those are the two things. Did you do what we did? Did you do what we, what we wanted you to do and take out everything? And did you take it out in such a way that uh, we verified that. And then whatever you did, you cleaned up and cleaned it up completely. So we passed clearance. Now, it is not uh, not to establish the so-called safe levels. That really was never it. Clearance is a, is a part of a process of a very careful visual inspection to verify in the abatement when is specified. You remove the materials completely. There's no residue. There's no dust. There's no debris. And the site is cleaned up and meets all the requirements of the specifications. It, it, you have documented, you have separation between your occupied and unoccupied areas. And then you meet these agreed upon levels. So when we look at the area, it's going to be cleaned of all visible dust, uh, debris, and residue, as I said. And usually the visual assessment that we use for this is the ASTM 1368 standard practice for visual inspection of asbestos abatement projects. And it is a very aggressive uh, uh, type of uh, inspection process where we're going around using literally white glove te te uh, techniques and uh, very high illumination at high incidence angles to see if we can actually see the fibers sticking off of pipes. It was uh, interesting the first time I saw somebody do that, they set the really high power flashlight on a pipe and you can actually see the the little uh, asbestos fibers sticking up from the pipe so let's look at the sampling process sampling process 
is usually following the visual inspection that makes sure everything is clean and, and everything is all ready to go. And this is usually prior, uh, after the application of lockdown. So you have your visual and you put this lockdown. This is an encapsulant we put on because we can't get all those tiny little fibers. We clean up the best we can, but we can't sit there with a hand lens and a mic and microscopically look at every square inch we're doing in tens of thousands of square feet of asbestos removal. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't be efficient. And I don't think we'd get that much better a performance out of it. So we get visually clean it and we stir the air up leaf blow all the surfaces and whatever's suspended is suspended and we we judge it by that now before we do air sampling uh, the uh, surfaces that have been covered with the encapsulant should usually have a 24-hour drying time now in current practice time is everything and again people can't wait one more dang minute anymore so so again uh, some some places they put the encapsulant on and they're in there you know an hour later taking clearance samples which can be a bad bad thing and one of the problems we have with people who are doing that are usually probably falsifying data because you have so much encapsulant in that air in part particulates even with the air air movers uh, turning over that you can actually have your 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 filters or will be covered with particulate and be unreadable so i don't know why people are rushing in there and then saying yeah we got clearance no probably not so so the current practice is and a few companies really uh don't wait the prescribed amount of time some are going in there while there's still stuff dripping off the rafters and whatnot so once dry the sampling process can start with aggressive sampling protocol the process used a leaf blower at a rate of five minutes per 1000 cubic foot now they now in in the historic documents we have that we look at this where this originates from the first one is the silver book again this is not silver this is a copy of the silver book but this came out in 1985 it pre it was the precursor to ahira and then under in uh in uh let's see what is this one the date on this one this is 1989 this is the blue book and the blue book basically gets into all these issues about how much volume you should take when you're doing pcm and tem sampling and uh, and also how many samples you need for each one and what do you do if you have multiple samples and there's been all kinds of of uh, mental gymnastics on this and some outright uh, fabrication of reality here on what really is necessary but anyway this aggressive sampling uh, procedure in those previous books was looked at as a one horsepower leaf blower used now you can't find a one horsepower leaf blower because now they do them with cubic feet per minute but anyway but you should sweep those areas with a powerful blasting of some uh, air blower for five minutes for every thousand square feet of floor area. And that's where we get it. We get that from those previous uh, documents there. OK, then we place box fans, 20 inch minimum, are placed throughout the area at a 45 degree angle and they're blowing up. And we need one fan for every 10,000 cubic feet of area. And what we're trying to do is whatever we stirred up with the leaf blowers, we're trying to keep suspended with the fans. And I've seen some creative fans. I've seen fans put flat on the floor. That's idiotic. Uh, again, you should have them on a stand or a chair. Again, well, they're dirty. Well, wipe them off. They should be clean fans. They should be clean things you're using to put them on. Uh, it's just, uh, again, think about what you're doing here and what you're trying to show here. Uh, the fans then run continuously through the sampling uh, procedure as well. Now, you don't want the fans blowing off onto or away from the sampler. Uh, all you want this is just to stir up and keep a nice uh, a nice homogenation of the area. And that's really what we're doing. You know, we're, we're going into a space, we're, we're stirring everything up, and we put a few fans around and keep everything suspended, and then I take five samples randomly spaced, and they shouldn't vary very much. That we know. That could work. I mean, we can do a statistical remedi uh, statistical analysis on that and be quite confident of that outcome. So this is why we use five samples. Uh, the minimum you should use is three. Now, in the new Texas state rules, they chose two, and I have no idea where they got that from. These government agencies are making me shake my head anymore. It's like, what? Two? Anyway, so you turn on the fans, and then you start the samples. Uh, samples uh, should not be running while while you're, uh, while the... Uh, uh, the uh, project manager or the air monitoring technician or whoever is taking the samples is uh, is using the leaf blower. That's going to, you know, the leaf blower, you run in there and you stir everything up. Then you get all the samples set up and then you turn the fans on. 
Uh, we sample at the requisite time to reach the volumes recommended for each process. Now for TEM, it's 1,200 to 1,800 liters. We don't want to go more than 1,800 because we can get it overloaded by other things. And then for, uh, uh, for PCM analysis, 3,000 to 3,850 liters. Now that is also in this particular book here, the blue book. It's in the silver book. It's always been in there because when we clear back, we're going to talk about the limit of quantification of 0 0.01 and where we actually got 0 0.01. And you're going to be alarmed because for 30 years, Everybody's been going like, well, this is, this is, this is perfectly fine. If you go into the NIOSH 7400 uh, uh, document, in, in, in where it's talking about sampling and how much volume you need, they, they specifically say, in, 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 uh, and I'll get the page number and everything for it, and what it says is clearly, it says at volumes much lower than, point, at, uh, comp, at, at concentrations much lower than 0.1 fibers per cc you need to take uh, a higher volumes, anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000 liters in order to actually quantify that information. Now, again, this is, this is a debate in PCM. It's like, well, uh, I don't want to take that much volume. I don't want to waste that much time. Well, and don't do PCM sampling. I mean, that's a limitation of it. Uh, the uh, volume are, as I said, in the NIOSH 7400 method, the blue book, the silver book, and the AHERA clearance method, and also it's in here, too. It's talked about in the uh, Environmental Information Association, Managing Asbestos in Buildings, a guide for building owners. It's in the clearance document section. So again, it, when you're doing the shortcut to taking 1,200 liters for PCM, and again, Texas requires a, a minimum of 1,250, but they have no maximum level for PCM clearance. I'm going to show you where actually, again, we borrowed the 1,200 from TEM and then applied it to TC, uh, PCM. So how many uh, samples in each analysis as well? Well, for TEM, the base is 13. Uh, when we hear about a HERA, Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act, that is the school's rule for asbestos uh, and how to handle it in that particular rule. And, and we talk about this in all of our classes. However, in the first silver book and the blue book, uh, the TEM, it is five samples inside the work area, five samples outside the work area, two blanks, one in, inside or near the entry, and then one outside representing out, uh, ambient and a sealed blank. Those are the minimums. And we have people running around, well, that's 13 per, uh, uh, that is 13 per uh, containment. It's not per containment. It's per homogeneous work area. And no, you don't have to do things like put tunnels in between them and do all that stuff. That's just, that's just nutty. If you have 10 rooms, they recommend you take one per each room and then average all those together. And that's what they're looking for clearance. Now, if your owner wants to do and clear each particular room as a particular containment, for whatever reason, they can do so. This rule came up and the 13 samples and the homogeneous work areas and doing all this really came up when these samples were $900 a piece. Of course, they weren't going to go 13 samples per each classroom because they weren't hooked together. That's, that was never the, that's just, that's just plain idiotic when you think about it. Just, just read the books. It'll tell you. So you may not like it or agree with it, but that's the history of the process. Now, the five, uh, five outside samples would not change. So in all these books, they say, you just got to take five outside samples. So if you have uh, 20 rooms, you take at least one sample per each room, and then you have five samples outside. And then you do your, do your math on, on that. And again, it's all in these books here. Uh, so example, if there are eight rooms in the work area, uh, many consultants and labs have mistakenly uh, stated that a separate room is a separate work area and therefore as per containment. And that is, a, is an interpretation. That is not true. That's not what the books are. It says a homogeneous work site. And it even goes in and says, if you got more than these rooms, whether they're hooked together or not, it's one per each one. So again, the uh, purpose of this is to is the blue and silver books was basically uh, to, uh, again, to make this efficient, both uh, economically and time-wise, so schools could get in, do these things, you could establish a level back to background clearance level, and then off you could move. So let's talk about what the clearance level is. The clearance level of transmission electron microscopy is 70 structures as of an average of those five samples, or if you had more rooms, 8, 10, 12, whatever, okay, for the five or more inside samples, or using a z-test, which is a statistical comparison of the inside samples minus the blanks, and then uh, compared with 
the other five samples that are collected outside. The 70 structures per millimeter square is probably no longer valid and should be used as much lower. As EPA has done has analyzed thousands of blanks, and I have stuff from I have some uh, letters. I, I lost my Aubrey Miller met letter, but during the Fort Worth method and uh, during the original Fort Worth method in 2005 and 2004, uh, Chris Weiss and uh, Aubrey Miller both had memos uh, that weren't very happy or flattering uh, toward the uh, EPA going like, well, if you get 70 structures per millimeter squared, you can do this stuff. And it, it, you know, it wasn't really a comparison of a safe level. And they were using it as a risk assessment based thing. And you can't, you can't use a, a blank for that. But anyway, through all the Superfund sites, the El Dorado County, California, the, uh, the Ground Zero cleanup in New York, the, uh, the uh, other, other things that have gone on, Clear Creek Wildlife Area, Libby, Montana, EPA has literally gone through thousands of, 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 uh, of uh, blanks. And the blank average in the AHERA method originally says uh, the average is actually 18 to 54 structures per millimeter squared. And that's what we're finding. So probably the 70 millimeter is probably not even, even relevant anymore. You probably ought to go much lower than that. But that's, again, that's a debate we can have as well. So... The tech has gotten much better. Uh, we've gotten much better on our blanks and our protections as well. But uh, again, we have not updated the level. And that's why I brought up the, the Weiss memo and the Miller memo that was discussing this same, this same 18 to 54 structures per millimeter squared and what EPA is actually finding on their blanks as well. So again, the TEM levels are pretty set in, and again, it's a comparison back to blank. So if I stir the air up and I take samples over a certain amount of time in a worst-case scenario, and I get less than blanks, I'm probably as low as I can possibly can. It might be a safe level, but it is definitely not going to get er any ever worse than that, and that's as good as we can get. Now, how about PCM? Hmm. Where do we get those levels? Well, we've heard this uh, 0.1 fibers per cc or uh, 0.01 fibers per cc. It is stated in AHERA, and people look at it as that's the concentration, but it is the limit of quantification at 0.01 fibers per cc. That's what the rule says. And the limit of quantification is calculated a bit differently. You have to take 100 fibers per millimeter squared, take enough to get that, and if you work it out to get to 0.01, you get 3,850 liters. That's, that's the math. So if you want to follow the science, that's following the science. If you got an argument with it, you got an argument with math and science, uh, not me. Uh, and uh, I actually put this in the Texas comments in, in, in when they were updating the process, and, and people were not happy about it. They're going like, well, it takes too long for clearance. <laughs> science takes time. I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it is what it is. But when we look at where we got the .01, I'm going to bring in the Hogue Levin video. That question. Medical authorities studying patterns of asbestos cancer now warn that there is no safe level of airborne asbestos contamination. The medical evidence shows that any level of asbestos contamination is likely to increase the number of cancers in exposed populations. But we live in a land which is virtually awash in airborne asbestos contamination. Even the air on our city sidewalks has significant levels of asbestos in it. So the question really is, what minimum level of airborne asbestos is reasonably acceptable in our buildings? In March of 1984, asbestos safety experts from North America and Europe assembled at the National Bureau of Standards in Gaithersburg, Maryland to discuss this question. No conclusions from this meeting have ever been published, but the general consensus expressed by participants was that an airborne fiber level of 0.01 fibers per cubic centimeter, as measured by an electron microscope at 10,000 magnification, represented a level which could be routinely achieved with currently available decontamination technology. And Hogue Levin is uh, 1984 routinely achievable levels following the asbestos abatement. Now that was a study that Hogue Levin referred to in his video, in his video testing, uh, testing buildings for asbestos. Uh, and uh, when we get down to that, it was looking where we got 0 .01, as you'll see in the video, was 10,000x at TEM, using TEM. So 
clearance level really never was PCM. What they basically said, well, that's equivalent to a blank on 0 0.01, 10,000 power with TEM. Why don't we just use that same number with PCM as a limit of quantification? And through time, it's just transmogorified into it's 0 0.01, that's the concentration, and that's the blank level. And that really isn't what it is. So, again, to set this out, we have the uh, TEM analysis set very clearly. It's statistical comparison, five in, five out. Have the average less than 70 structures, the blank. If that's not satisfied, then you probably ought to uh, do the Z-test. Again, if you don't want to do the Z-test, you could test again. Or you could probably use 18 to 54 structures per millimeter squared. Again, that, that's a professional judgment there. Remember, the 70 structures per millimeter squared average is a minimum. Well, a maximum of clearance, if you will. PCM, 0 0.01 from 1984 at 10,000 power. So choose the limit of quantification of PCM at 0 0.01 would then, you know, that would be actually taking the requisite amount of liters under NIOSH, the blue book, the silver book, and everything else. Now, there is uh, something you do need to look at from a good, what, what brings this up, as I said, what brought this up before is the fact that, that Texas is going to probably start doing the non-friable organically bound analysis, which means there's going to be a lot more people probably using TEM for bulk samples. And one of the arguments in, in the bulk sampling issue is um, if you can't see them, why are you using that analysis technique? And some of the, most of the fibers we have in floor tile are smaller than the PEM, PLM, uh, polarized light microscopy uh, resolution capabilities. Uh, a guy named uh, Angelo Garcia out of New York, he runs a uh, blog. It's called Environmental, uh, Future Environmental Design Blog. Uh, again, it's not an old blog site. And uh, he's got a, uh, a, uh, a uh, blog on there talking about the, uh, the clearance levels of uh, TEM versus that with floor tile specifically. It was a great floor tile controversy. And it is a very informative. It has a Texas study done by Robert Crossman that discusses these, uh, these uh, fibers they find. And there's some alarming uh, data in there uh, looking at uh, 12 by 12 floor tile. It was negative under PLM, polarized light microscopy analysis. And then when, it, when subjected to TEM bulk analysis, you know, we get, you're getting, you know, 5 to 9%. And uh, that could be a, a big concern. That's probably what we're going to see in uh, Texas. But just like New York has still been arguing since the whole time they've gone from non-friable analysis to where, what do you clear with? And about on their own surveys done on that, on that uh, asbestos uh, blog that, uh, that Angelo put up, uh, about 53% of the time people are using TEM and the rest of the time people are using uh, PCM for clearance only. And a lot of times they find that, that T, uh, they'll pass PCM and then fail TEM with floor tile. So uh, we're going to have that discussion in Texas. And that was, that is what I wanted to have out here with TEM and PCM. And again, it's one of those things, again, PCM was really never designed for clearance. It really was developed as a, uh, as a uh, exposure assessment for respirators and for personal exposures, for your personal uh, personal monitoring, uh, that's really what the PN Cam 239 application was. And we've pushed it way past probably what the validation is for. But if you're not going to collect the requisite um, the requisite volume in order to get to your detection limits and limits of quantification, any analytical tool is meaningless at that point. So if you if you can't get to detection limit and you can't get to quantification limit, you can't say you got below that either. And since the uh, PCM level is dependent volumetrically and by loading on their limit of quantification, if you're not going to do that, you probably want to do TEM uh, sample analysis in the future. Now, there's an argument to be made on, on floor tile analysis that, you know, floor tile is not like fireproofing. Just because you break floor tile, uh, fibers don't magically fall out of floor tile on those breaks. However, you break it up in small pieces, you can get plenty. And probably floor tile is not monolithic either. Uh, it, it probably is more like something that is um, 
uh, it, it has variation in it. So it's not like all floor tile are the same. They behave similar, but as they wear and the various lots of manufacturers and whatever binding material they put in and, you know, all kinds of variations in there, it is similar, but it's not identical most of the time. So, so our, our uh, concept of having this, oh, all floor tile jobs are the same probably is not reasonable. So at the end, you're going to ask me what I think about TEM versus PCM. I think if you really want to know, and if you're going to be uh, consistent in your exposure assessment, if you're going to be concerned like, oh, my God, I broke floor tile, it's friable, we need to have air monitoring. Well, you probably ought to do TEM then. I mean, <laughs> if, you're, if you're that concerned about it. If you are looking for uh, absolute um, within the analytical limits, well, you need to take the volume to get to PCM to li get to limit of clarification, uh, limit of uh, quantification. However, you have to clarify that by saying that PCM is not going to count a lot of small fibers, and that is one of the one of the things that Angelo's uh, blog brought up so well uh, was that the, uh, the number of fibers, and this came out of the Texas study, the number of fibers that you see are much smaller than five microns. So you're not even going to see them. And that is that that really um, echoes what EPA found on almost all their TEM, PCM comparisons, whether it was the alternative asbestos control method, the uh, the Superfund sites dealing with, with uh, asbestos or their vermiculite sites and everything. They just found out, you know, up to anywhere from 22 to 42, 44 more times fibers you find and that's even the thinner ones that you would normally see on PCM because you don't have that resolution with T to, with uh, PCM at 400 power that you have with TEM at 10,000 or 20,000 power at the minimums there. So if you wanted to know and you wanted to have your liability protection, probably TEM is the way to go. And they're a lot cheaper. They're not $900 a sample anymore. Uh, so, so anyway, that's uh, pretty much what I've got as far as TEM versus PCM. And I hope you enjoyed that little snippet from Hogue Levin from a visit back to 1984. Uh, but it, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of history. History is in books. You need to read books, and you need to make sure you know history because those who do not know their history are probably doomed to repeat it. Well, uh, thanks for uh, tuning in again, and I appreciate your support. If you really like these uh, videos, go ahead and hit that uh, subscription bell and hit the uh, like uh, like button. And uh, if you got any comments, put them down below. I'm sure the TEM versus T P uh, PCM uh, debate is going to go on and uh, knock yourself out. Till later, though, I hope you fare well.